Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, where our experts bring you fresh ideas and new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom and think. My name is Sam Dover. I'm a Category Director for Beauty and Personal Care here at Mintel in the UK. And today we're going to be discussing sustainability, the business case for it, the different sustainability frameworks businesses can utilise, and how to effectively communicate sustainability missions with consumers. So today I'm joined by my colleagues David Luttenberger and Richard Cope and so now I'm going to pass over to them and ask them to both briefly introduce themselves. Let's start with David. Hey, good morning. I am David Luttenberger. I'm the Global Packaging Director for Mintel. I've been in the business of packaging 30 years, uh, 20 of which I have been uh, intimately studying, advising, uh, and researching the topic of sustainability, specifically as it relates to package, package innovation, and the business of packaging. Hi, Sam. I'm Richard Cope. I'm the Senior Trends Consultant um, here in Europe, and I'm also the author of Mintel's Annual Sustainability Barometer Study now in its second year. And I spend my time doing lots of uh, bespoke projects for clients, helping them understand sustainability from a consumer perspective and a market perspective more. Uh, And yeah, great to be here with you guys today. Amazing. So, We have covered sustainability or the topic of sustainability a few times on the podcast now, most recently exploring um, Mintel's sustainability barometer, as mentioned by Richard there, which essentially explores consumer attitudes towards sustainability. So please do go back and check out episode 95 if that is of interest. But today we're going to build on that episode and really talk about the realities that business face when striving to become more sustainable. So with that in mind, I'm going to dive straight into my first first question. So taking into consideration the challenges that businesses are facing right now, why should they invest in sustainability? And are there any credible reasons why they should not or invest in it? Well, I think right now uh, it's very tempting for a lot of companies to think now is not the time to do this. They're obviously facing a lot of understandable pressures. I would actually argue now is a really good time to do this um, with the caveat that that does involve making some big investments. I think the lessons we're seeing now in things like uh, supply line shortages, rising fuel prices, it's really a lesson in resilience. And that word resilience is one of the key things you see coming up again and again whenever the business case is made about sustainability. It's, I think what we're seeing now with the war in Ukraine is a kind of harsh lesson in the shortages which are going to come as a result of droughts and climate change when it comes to a lot of uh, commodities and as well as escalating fuel prices. So I think it's giving us a harsh lesson in the need to sort of safeguard future resources, uh, invest in generally sustainable supply lines, invest in alternatives, invest in things like renewable energy to give you the um, independence uh, going forward. Um, so I really think it is it is a good time to do this and it's giving us a harsh lesson. So in the short term, you might get, look at this at a sort of administration level, you might get a government like Germany. Yes, they're reopening some, some coal mines in the short term or yes, the US government's up, upping gas production. But in the longer term, they're you know bringing forward their targets for using renewable energy and, and, and things like that and increasing their capacity additions because they realize it's, it's a harsh lesson in that is the way we've got to go. Yeah, I would agree with that. I really like your term, Richard, resilience, but I think that resilience idea goes hand in hand with sustainability, almost as an insurance policy. Uh, As consumers are looking for brands and products that match with their lifestyles, their mindsets, their purchasing behaviors, it becomes a value proposition, uh, that differentiation going forward when price quality, perceived uh, value are equal, that next value proposition will become that responsibility to the environment. And brands right now, package manufacturers, retailers cannot afford to lag in their innovation process and their attention to sustainability, to economic and social equity, those sorts of things. So right now, the investment, while it may not pay off immediately, in sustainability or what I like to call responsibility is really an insurance policy against your future. And I don't like the word survivability, but your viability. I'd like to pick up on, yeah, that point you make about differentiation, David. And we often, I think we agree on this, that 
having more responsible products doesn't necessarily um, make you more money or allow you to charge a premium possibly, but it does sort of uh, enhance loyalty and uh, differentiate you in the market. And those factors don't go away just because we're facing difficult circumstances right now. So I think one of the other key arguments for embracing um, more sustainable practices is also your brand reputation. And just because there's a load of difficult challenges on the horizon now from inflation to shortages doesn't mean activists are going to stop um, attacking companies they perceive to be transgressors in this area. So we can't sort of uh, let up on our vigilance to sort of, you know, try and uh, maintain our reputation and make sure, you know, we're not just waiting to be attacked. So there's never a time to sort of stop taking action on that. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I would never want to say that environmental responsibility, sustainability, social equity, those sorts of things are a defense that a company should use. But certainly uh, to be proactive in those areas will allow you to stay ahead of that fray. Uh, because once activists speak up, once they engage with consumers on social media, it's extremely difficult for a brand to then say, well, we've always been doing this or to justify what they are going to do next. If they've got that track record, if they say we've been doing this, this is what we've achieved. This is how we've communicated to consumers. Those actions become something that makes it easier for them to tell a truthful and transparent story rather than having to go back and re-justify what they have done. Yeah, definitely. And I think that leads very nicely onto my next question. So there are obviously so many issues to tackle. Um, and one of the biggest things that I know our clients are always asking us on this topic is where to start. They just don't know where to begin. So I, as two people who I know have probably faced this question a lot when speaking to clients, what kind of advice do you give businesses when they ask that question? Yeah, you know, pick this one up first because I think for me, it's an easy question to answer or to advise our mental clients on. And I say, what do you believe in? What's important to you as an organization? What reflects your ethos as a brand manufacturer, as a products or goods manufacturer? But also, are you, do you have empathy with your consumers? Do you understand what's important to them? And are you communicating with them and we understand what you want, what's important to you, and bring that into harmony with what they're doing. Don't try to be something that you're not. Don't try to be this big green company if you're a harsh chemicals manufacturer. Don't try to overnight change your reputation. So find out first and foremost what the ethos of your company is, what you believe in, and this basically set some priorities It's and then attack those priorities one by one. It's sustainability or achieving, in my case, you know, sustainable packaging. It's not an all or nothing proposition. Little steps do count. What counts most is that you do just start something, you know, and that's where Mintel can really help is help you prioritize what's important and what's I think more importantly, what's actually achievable. I mean, it's great to set goals that are maybe a little bit beyond your reach, but we always have to achieve some type of goal. So maybe setting a small goal and achieve it rather than trying to set these huge overarching goals that garner great headlines, but are practically or in theory just really not achievable. Yeah, I agree entirely with that, David. Um, and, and building on your points, I think, uh, I think it's important to say don't let this be a consumer led issue so building on your point about you know doing what's what makes sense for you as a company it's about looking you know where is your footprint where are your emissions where can you make impactful changes so if you're seeing you know, all the market graduate towards plastic free or something for that. If plastic free does not make sense, you know that that is not a viable solution. It's not going to reduce uh, resource use, for example, then stick to your guns on that um, and assert that. And that, that brings in another point you made, David, that you part of this process is also identifying what your customer wants, what your customer understands, even if they still need educating on, on these issues. And that might be something you reveal. And I think that level of fallibility um, you, you kind of allude to there, David, I think is really important. People don't expect an overnight success. You know, think about even your most 
you know, um, responsibly driven consumers aren't going to manage to, uh, you know, achieve all of their goals instantly. They appreciate it takes time. So I think it's fine for a company to sort of, you know, take small steps as long as they sort of outline what the plan is. Um, and as part of that, yeah, it's about understanding your own operations. Where is your footprint? Where can you make the most impactful decisions? Understand where you need to educate your customers understand which of your markets are you know most engaged maybe more engaged than others that can help you prioritize not just where you need to take action in terms of your operations but where you need to take actions in terms of your markets as well and then the other thing we can help with of course is um you know, do landscape of the markets and sort of show you what people are doing in your sector and maybe what they're not doing where, where are the gaps yeah and i think another piece of this that a lot of organizations don't really look at is you have these efforts are being driven a lot of times by a director of information or director of sustainability or a director of brand management. But I always emphasize, do you truly have the resources and the commitment from senior leadership? And when I say senior leadership, I mean the board of directors, the CEO. Do you truly believe and have those people demonstrated that they are putting resources toward a good, solid business case around this. I mean, yes, we would all love to reduce our use of plastics, you know, to use a more responsible material uh, to educate consumers. But make no mistake, uh, package manufacturers, brands, retailers are in business to make money. There has to be a business case presented to senior leadership, and that senior leadership has to show and demonstrate that there is full both emotional support, financial support, uh, resources in R&D that are really going to get an organization to where it wants to be, uh, where it needs to be, and is responsible in communicating to the constituent consumer, whoever that may be, that we are doing things that will ultimately get us to a better place. It may not happen today or tomorrow, um, but it, we are working toward that. But that, that buy-in and more importantly, that solid commitment by that leadership is so important for the business case of sustainability. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to your first question, really, Sam. I think it's, you know, it's about doing it for the right reasons. And by that, I think we both mean not just doing it to, you know, for the betterment of the environment, but yeah, do it to be a success as a business, do it to make money and go part of that resilience. Um, we both talked about is about, you know, reducing the amount of resources you use to save you money as well as, you know, reduce your impact on the environment. So yeah, do, do it for the right reasons, do it for strategic reasons. If you're ever doing this just to kind of keep up with the Joneses or make yourself look good next to everyone else and you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So yeah, put your heart and your wallet into it, I think is uh, what we're getting at. But if you also look at the uh, the global um, sustainability indices, companies that actively participate, support, innovate, and are leaders in the area of environmental and social responsibility actually outperform like the S&P 500, the global 500. Uh, and that's been proven. And I think that's going to be more important and an even bigger part of the, uh, an overall business proposition for, again, manufacturers, retailers, brands, because they are going to see that there is investment by, uh, you know, equity in uh, equity partners and in sustainability initiatives or in companies and brands who actively report and continue to, uh, to advance the ideas of environmental responsibility, social responsibility. So there is a greater value proposition for investors, for the companies, for shareholders in, uh, solid, ongoing sustainability efforts. And we see the same thing at a product level, right, David? So, you know, it's also the products which are being sort of positioned or at least marketed as having some kind of uh, being more responsible environmentally. They're outperforming a lot of riper products as well. They're the ones which are growing faster. Obviously, Unilever is one of the brands where that's been um, really celebrated in recent years that their sort of product lines in those areas are the ones which are performing best for the business. So, yeah, we see it at a, at a sort of corporate return level, but also see it at a product level as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I'm going to jump in again now because I think we've made a very good case for the why, but I want to bring it back to the how businesses tackle this. So the UN or United Nations has essentially outlined 17 sustainable development goals. Um, we may refer to those throughout this conversation as SDGs uh, for anyone listening. That's what we're referring to. So I know that the that framework, so to speak, is shaping a lot of how businesses are approaching sustainability efforts at the minute. So those 17 goals, that's a long list. So I'm really intrigued to know how should businesses approach those goals uh, and are there or and or are there any other kind of frameworks or guidelines that businesses should be taking into consideration at the minute? Yeah, I believe the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are sort of this next generation of the framework. We had sustainability, we had environmental, social, and government governance, the ESGs. And for a large part, those were very, I don't want to say generic, but they were very general. And consumers today are very much interested in how your brand, your products uh, enable responsibility in very specific ways, such as what impact do they ha have on marine life or soil conservation or water or air or even such things as paying a living wage uh, for ingredient sourcing or those sorts of things. So the UN's SDGs are very specific in what is being addressed. Is it social inequity? Is it water? Is it fair uh, pay? Is it inclusion? Is it the creation of jobs for the underserved? And using the SDGs is a way to communicate with consumers, to shareholders in, a, in that business proposition about the specifics of what we are doing. And I think it also shows what Richard and I talked about earlier about going back to what's important to me, what's, what's within the ethos of my brand. And I know I can't solve the world, all the world's problems, but for me and my brand and the consumers who like my brand, buy my brand, we understand these specific things are important and that's what we're going to address right now. Perfect. Before you jump in there, Richard, I'm going to just quickly ask, we mentioned um, SDGs and I heard in that conversation you mentioned ESGs. What are ESGs? Yes, that's environment, social and governance. But again, they are somewhat Again, I don't want to say generic, but they are more broad, more general, where the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, with 17 of them, they are very specific in what they address. Perfect. Thank you. Just picking up on that acronym, Sam, uh, ASG, um, I think last week's issue, The Economist really nailed it, where they said we should stop talking, we should just talk about emissions rather than environment. And they were saying, you know, let's, let's make it less general and be specific. And I think that's one of the things to say about the sustainable development goals is um, certainly companies present what they're doing along those lines. So you go onto any company's website and start looking at what they're doing, and those icons are everywhere. To what degree they're acting on them or actually achieving things is is open to debate. And I think that's why, you know, the economist was talking about let's talk about emissions reductions rather than just environmental do-gooding. But the challenge is, um, I guess, you know, the 17 SDGs, they they apply to all businesses. So any business would look at those and think, yeah, because of, you know, we use natural capital, we use social capital. I mean, all of these 17 things apply to any business. They have to address every one of them. Um, but as David said, it's about looking at the ones which are most relevant for your business. So, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're a business which has a very, you know, huge water footprint or your business which uses marine resources or impacts on marine resources. So, yeah, it's about choosing the ones that really um, – match well to your business and again just like presenting them in um in a credible way um and we're increasingly just as companies are uh you know at least outwardly presented their strategy in those ways we're trying to make our research and mintel fit the sdgs as well and sort of you know help you know companies try and activate consumers against uh different ones of those and i think your point about carbon and emissions is really important within mintel's global new products database we've seen close to a 200% increase just in the past several years of on-pack carbon claims. Um, and I, I think that presents something to consumers that's a little bit more quantifiable than just a general mm -hmm. obtuse, we are more sustainable. You know, to talk about, you know, 
the, a quantifiable measurement of emissions that we are reducing or addressing. So, and that's, and I agree with you totally, Richard, that one of the drawbacks of the SDGs is they're sort of self-monitored, self-regulated. There are no qualifications, no point systems, no third-party validations for you to be able to say we are addressing one or five or multiple of the SDGs. You can use them somewhat randomly. And I think they're, they're, we could run into the same problems with those where people are, I don't say people, but brands, uh, manufacturers are using them sort of somewhat gratuitously. Yeah. I mean, the devil's in the detail. You go onto yeah. sort of any, any company's corporate report and it's very easy to see, uh, you know, the SDG on res- responsible consumption production come up and they'll start talking about how much, you know, they've reduced carbon in their operations. There's some very impressive stats. And then if you dig deeper, you'll see, oh, actually, only 3% of your emissions come from your operations and 97% of it is in your supply chain, which isn't yeah. accounted for yet. So, yeah, it's all about the, the detail and delving into that, of course. And uh, it's not to say that the SDGs aren't valuable. We are already seeing big organizations that we work with, Unilever, Avery Denison, Tetra Pak, uh, are addressing the SDGs and using those icons to communicate and to inform uh, their suppliers, their manufacturers, what they are doing to help consumers understand where they are being specific. Yeah, I think there ultimately there there does need to be more of a reporting structure, a qualification, some type of point system, validation, third party validation uh, to be able to use them, to make them as meaningful as I'm sure the UN set out to, to make them. So another thing that I feel like a lot of our clients come to us and ask us about is the idea of how to communicate all of this to the average consumer so obviously you know we've got huge amounts of work going on in the background and if as you know if businesses are looking at you know frameworks as massive as the sustainable development goals there's a lot to communicate and there's a lot to get across to consumers and it's how you do that in a in a way that's going to resonate and actually hit home right so you know how can businesses communicate what they're doing and also you know how important is it to Keep pace with how your competitors are communicating what they're doing as well. Well, to build on some of David's points about quantifying things, that comes through very strongly in the barometer research we've done. People want to understand, not just by working with a responsible company, but they want to understand at a product level, what is the benefit or the impact of buying that product. So they want metrics and information on the water, uh, the CO2 uh, involved in that product. Those metrics, those Things have to be communicated in ways people can understand. So it has to have context, either against a rival product or what that means in a larger context. So I think that's really key. Um, People obviously want the convenience. I think a lot of the labeling we've seen in in health on on, on packaged goods in terms of, you know, um, color-coded scores, Nutri-scores, those kind of things, I think that's going to come into this territory very quickly. We've already seen groups like Mondra uh, bringing that along. So I think people want that as well. I think... The other thing, you know, I'm sure David will build on this, but is obviously around transparency. You know, we're still falling into the trap of using the wrong lexicons. We're still talking about things being environmentally friendly. Yes. None of these products are environmentally friendly. It's just that some of them are less environmentally damaging um, than others. I recently did a podcast with a lady from Innocent who was talking about the campaign they got uh, in trouble for recently, which was accused of a, suggesting that by buying Innocent products, you were benefiting the environment, where clearly you are not. By buying Innocent products like everything else, you're having an impact on the environment, maybe a lesser impact than if you bought a rival product. But it's key we get away from that. And I think David's other point earlier is another thing we should try and do communications is, is educate uh, consumers and try and explain things to them more. Yeah, and I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. I'm, this may sound odd, but I'm not so much a fan, Richard, of educate. What I try to communicate is inform and enlighten because when you, when we begin to say, well, let us educate you, it feels like, oh, you know, you're blaming me. You're saying I'm not as smart as you. Uh, you know, I have to sit in a classroom, you know, sort of these negative, negative connotations come up. But to me, it's about inform me. Tell me just, What's going on? And then that enlightenment. Help me a little bit understand why in this occasion, this material, in this region, what it means to me. It's great that you're using renewable energy or that you've reduced your CO2 in transportation or sourcing, but I don't see you reducing 
the price of your goods and services to me. So based on the inputs that you have done, what does it mean to me as a consumer? And we know from some of the research at Mintel that consumers look to brands even more than governments or themselves to do more to protect and preserve the environment than a consumer can do for his or herself. However, those same consumers are looking to those brands to tell them what the right thing to do is. So just, I'm a big fan of what I call show and tell graphics. It's great if you can tell me on a package, can I recycle it? What can I do with it in an end of life or second life scenario? Can I refill it, reuse it? But if you can give me like a little visual as well and not only tell me what to do, but very clearly, very succinctly show me, do I leave the cap on? Do I take the cap off? Do I take the bag out of the box, throw the bag away, recycle the box? So things like or schemes like the how to recycle label, I think are going to do much more to help the consumer understand actually how to properly dispose, recycle, refill. What can I actually do with this? So those, I like to just say, give me a show and tell graphic. I would love it if it was on the front panel of the package because, you know, again, when price and quality and value are equal, if I don't see that little icon or that graphic because it's on the bottom of the pack, the side of the pack, and I don't pick it up, But we know brand managers have a lot of other important information to communicate to consumers on that front of pack. But just just give me that little show and tell graphic somewhere. Uh, The other thing that we're seeing, Richard, and you know this, is particularly, as you mentioned, with emissions and carbon. And I mentioned we're beginning to see more and more of these carbon claims. Consumers are beginning to understand that, well, maybe carbon offsetting isn't so good. Maybe they're just buying their way out of environmental responsibility, but helping, we're seeing brands like Oatly saying, we reduced our emissions and there's an icon on the front of the pack, uh, the oat brand uh, milk, but then on the side of the pack, they've informed or enlightened. They've said, here's what these numbers mean, but they've done it in a way that doesn't get into the deep science. It just engages consumers. It informs them, it enlightens them, and it makes the consumer feel like there's transparency here. I'd agree with all of that. But on the uh, education point, the explanation point, I guess I think what I'm trying to get at here is, and it fits in with the points you made about transparency, it's the fact that a brand like Patagonia bothered to respond to consumers saying, why are you sending my jacket in a plastic bag? And they went to the trouble of explaining why, that the footprint of that plastic protecting the huge amount of energy and resources which had gone into creating that jacket, you know, that's the reason they did it. It was, it would, they basically did the maths on this or at a lifestyle level. I think I agree entirely when nobody wants to be lectured or hit over the head with big statistics, but you get a beauty brand like bare necessities we've seen in India because they're creating products, which are kind of lifestyle products people are using on a daily basis. It was quite a nice natural fit for them to extend into um, indeed lifestyle courses or lifestyle guides that consumer can extend into if they want to. So that's giving advice on how people can actually um, reduce their impact. But yeah, it's important to say that was offered rather than kind of bludgeoned, uh, you know, with the consumer as regards. But I think you're right about offsetting as well. I mean, I think certainly here, BrewDog is a brand which is definitely uh, stock has fallen a little bit in terms of you know all their pledges about um, forestation and offsetting regards to that. And I think people want instant results. So your point about actually emissions reductions, or if we're going to get into biodiversity, actually stopping a mature forest being chopped down by supporting something like the World Land Trust, that's going to have an immediate tangible impact. And you know that's what we see consumers want in every other aspect of um, what they're doing. So the same goes for sustainability. I think you know instant results uh, you know people can understand yeah I, I love that idea of instant results we are a society of instant gratification and when we see so many commitments by major uh, organizations these days within like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation where they're saying by 2025 and 2030 all of my packaging is going to be recyclable or made from 100% recycled content those types of commitments generate headlines but consumers are saying okay gosh that's another five years another 10 years down the road what are you doing it's like what have you done for me lately what impact can i have right now and that's where we see that on pack communication being so vital to help consumers understand 
what I call that hyper actionability. Based on the inputs that you have given me, what can I do right now to re, you know, to be actionable, to take action, to reduce my own footprint? What we're now seeing emerge is being called the carbon handprint, which is what a, a, a consumer can do based on the inputs that a brand has given. Thinking about it, and it just seems like there's so many different layers to it. There's kind of long term versus short term. Then there's, you know, the basic information that you need to give consumers to make decisions. Then also backing that up with, you know, there's added layers of information for people who really want to engage and learn more and more. So, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And I mean, you've tapped on a few or you've touched on a few different um, brand examples. And I feel like I'd like to try and maybe highlight a couple of others just to help kind of un- better understand you know what's going on and you know what's best practice and worst practice so is there anything else we can you know any other brands that we can call out um here as well yeah i think a couple that i would call to i mean unilever uh, over the past several years uh with their compressed can technology i mean they had done I believe everything they reasonably thought they could do within package engineering to lightweight, to thin wall, to source reduce their, their aerosol cans. So they totally went back to the drawing board and reformulated the product so they could put basically the same amount of product and propellant in a package half the size. But key to that was on each of the cans that they used, there was a green ring at the top that said, this is a compressed can. This is what it means. This is what it means to you as a consumer. And if you don't believe you are getting the same amount of product, the same amount of product per dispenses, but at the same price point. So now you're getting a can that's half the size at the same price point. So there had to be that, as Richard said, that that education piece about what the value proposition is here but they did it in such uh, a succinct manner an easy manner helping consumers understand what's in it for them what's in it for the environment it was so successful as a product they were able to roll it out from one women's deodorant uh, product rexona in the uk to many products all across europe Uh, Another one I'll give very quickly is I give Coca-Cola a lot of credit. When they were doing some experimentation with ocean plastics, they did not come out with a big headline saying ocean plastics are the future of packaging. They said, we are going to experiment. We're going to make 400 bottles to examine the potential in the future of using ocean plastics as a complement to other responsible plastics. So they did not make any broad you know, sweeping uh, headlines saying this is the future. They're saying we are exploring the potential. So I think they really did a great job of of setting expectations among the consumers about we uh, we we empathize. We know ocean plastics are an issue. We know plastics are an issue. We are looking into it. We're looking at the potential. They did not make promises, and I think that's so important. I think they respected their audience, and you know that's what I'd like to talk oh, about. Yeah. And a couple yeah. of examples of what what not to do. Uh, and in the, in the packaging world, uh, one I find myself talking about a lot is this uh, recent Maltesers campaign when they changed their box packaging, so they laudably reduced uh, plastic in there, but they decided to convey that in metrics where they talked about it being a reduction equivalent to eighteen Tyrannosaurus Rexes, I love which that. my yeah. son would love. But in terms of context. Uh, it's pretty, it infantilizes the issue. And I think it is, it's, it's very, uh, confusing and, uh, sets the agenda back for consumers. I guess another bad one was, um, Burger King putting some low methane, uh, beef on the market where they talked about a re- emissions reduction of a third, completely ignoring the first 15 months of life of the cow. Uh, and then if you look at the small print, this was only available in five restaurants. And that's Burger King's global yeah. empire. So that's not how to do it. You know, you're going to get found out if you if you do anything like that. So don't do that. I mean, Unilever, I was going to talk about, I mean, um, I just think the fact that they're smartly reformulating products to sort of bring that resilience we talked about at the start, reducing the amount of um, resources in there, saving themselves and the customer's money, potentially. Now, the one I'd like to talk about is um, the tech reseller back market uh, from France, which is, you know, active in, in lots of countries. What I really love about them is 
it's a very uh, it's an environmentally beneficial thing, obviously, to repurpose and resell technology rather than use resources for new ones. But they've really soft pedaled the sustainability element of this, so they've they've appealed to the other things consumers want. So consumers want value. Consumers have egos. Consumers want to be different. And back markets campaigns have really kind of appealed to consumers' desire to be smart and savvy and save money and not queue up with all the other sheep to buy a new Apple product or a new Samsung product. So they've kind of pushed those buttons first and soft pedaled the sustainability and done a really good job compared to something like Maltinas's of quantifying the carbon that's saved or the liters of water which is saved and the money saved by the customers. I think that's one of the best campaigns I've seen, I think, recently. I've, I've never been a fan when one package format says we are more sustainable than another because there's trade-offs, there's pros and cons to ever. But I've recently seen some on pack communication on some stand-up pouches that have said compared to a comparable size glass bottle, we have reduced water use, we've reduced land use, we've reduced our our emissions. So I think they have they're calling attention to the differences, the value propositions uh, in a way that I'm not a huge fan of, but I think it's fair and it's quantifiable and they can back it up. But I always caution, uh, don't ever say we are the most sustainable uh, because there's there's always going to be a hole in your argument. You can say we are being more responsible, uh, but this, to claim we are the most sustainable because there are, there are eight very specific criteria within the definition of sustainable packaging alone. There is no one package right now that can meet all eight of those criteria. So you do have to consider who we are as a brand, what's important to us, and what are the trade-offs here, and, and where's the value proposition. Yeah, I like your point, David, talking about responsibility again and again. It's about being more responsible or, you know, less impactful. And that that's the way we need to hear brands start to talk about this more. Otherwise, they're going to get in trouble with uh, advertising standards when they start claiming that they're environmentally um, beneficial or uh, friendly. Well, here in the U.S., the uh, F, uh, the Federal Trade Commission is re uh Look, re-examining its green guides, and they're going, as you said earlier, they're going to look at very specific um, claims such as earth-friendly, environmentally friendly. What does green mean? Uh, those are all going to be looked at uh, in this new revision of the green guides, and hopefully they'll be able to enforce it finally. I'm going to throw in a very last short question because it's sprung to mind as you've both been speaking, but I feel like with this, you've kind of touched on it a little bit there, but... <sighs> It feels like a scary thing to do, but do you think brands and businesses need to call out what they're not doing yet and what they can't do or what they're struggling to do as well as kind of highlighting the good? I I think it's important, and again, I will speak for packaging, that we have asked so little of packaging in the past 100 years. Basically, safely transport, dispense. That's what we want to do. But now consumers want this packaging nirvana. All of a sudden, they want the most sustainable packaging. They want the elimination of all plastics. They're not thinking about the responsible use of plastics or all packaging. So I think we need to help consumers understand that in the past 100 years, we've come this far. We are not going to get to that ultimate sustainable, responsible solution by June of 2025 or whenever it is. It's going to take a while. But again, I think that empathy, that understanding of your consumer about what's important to them, what fits within our ethos, what can we achieve right now? And also to help them understand, it's not that we have fallen short. It's just we haven't been able to get to it yet. We know it's important. It's on our list of priorities. I mean, with all the media coverage coming out of um COP26, you know, people know we're a long way off. People know what we're on course for 2.4 degrees of warming at the moment. So fallibility uh, is admissible. So, yeah, I do think it's uh, fine for companies to talk about um, what they haven't done yet. But rather than just put 2050 targets and say we're going to do it, I think 
consumers want some hope. They um, so I think we need to see more brands talking about the research they're doing uh, and start some putting money into that to try and find new solutions, solutions which don't exist yet. Whether that's in recycling technology, or whether that's in carbon capture, or whatever it might be in, or you know new strains of different crops which can survive in higher temperatures or more um, salty conditions and things. So you know that's what we need to see more of. I think more brands putting money into research and as they are doing, but talking about it a bit more and giving people some hope. And I think, again, Coca-Cola did a good job of that. You can you can Google it. You can go to YouTube and see the video. But when they talked about we are we are experimenting and looking at the potential. So I think that's important that they let consumers know they are they're aware of it. They're working on it. Hopefully they'll get there. Amazing. Thank you both so much. I'm going to jump in. I could keep going and ask you both questions all day and keep listening to you both, but we're definitely running out of time now. So I know that this has been an incredibly informative conversation, but I'd now like to just very quickly recap so to really highlight to our listeners what we really want them to take away from this conversation. So if you both had three recommendations or thought starters that you want listeners to take away from today, what would they be? One we haven't really touched on yet, but I'll, I'll quickly talk about is um, there's this tension between sort of natural and, and synthetic or, or nature or science, and that's something brands have to resolve. So they need to sort of mimic nature and use things like natural design where, you know, waste equals food in nature, you know, solar is the source, you know, diversity is the way things work. So they need to embrace that, but they also need to find a way of selling in the science as well, selling in some of the less familiar solutions. Um, second thing, very briefly, it's increasingly going to be about emissions reductions rather than offsetting, as we've all already looked at in terms of what companies are doing. And in terms of how to get things to resonate um, with customers, let's say you do have a more responsible product or service. Um, back to the point I was making about back market, it's about not just assuming this is going to sell based on its sustainable ethical credentials. It isn't. It has to be good value. It has to be convenient. It has to appeal to people's other desires, whether it's their ego, their desire to be uh, more individual, whatever it might be. And you might have to soft pedal the sustainability angle and look at selling it in through other credentials because a more, a more responsible product or service it's still a product or a service and it's got to be better than the other products and services um, on the on the common grounds before we get into um, environmental or ethical credentials. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point there that people aren't going to buy just because it's environmentally responsible. Uh, environmental responsibility is not going to supplant value, convenience, quality, price. Uh, those are all givens. This is just something on top of that. Uh, building on Richard's point of, you know, looking at different, you know, ideas about what's possible. I think we have to, as brands, as package manufacturers, again, have to go back and say what's important to us. And then as we are developing products and packaging in harmony, to not just consider next generation or non-fossil fuel alternatives, but we have to look at every material available to us and find out which one is the more responsible for this occasion and always consider that there's going to be trade-offs and that sustainability is not about just using PLA, the, the plant-based you know, uh, polymers for plastics, those sorts of things. It's not going to be just about you know, you know, ocean plastics, but consider, make sure that every material option is in consideration. Uh, again, I, I have to build on what Richard said that I think the idea, uh, like with back market, is consider the hyper actionability, not just the headline. That the headline certainly generates interest, but it's not actionable. It's not that carbon handprint that the consumer can act on. They're not going to buy your product because you've made a commitment to something in 2030 or 2050. What can I do with it today? And then again, the on pack claims, you know, be specific, look at those sustainable development goals, help the consumer understand why you're using this, why you are doing this and communicate it very clearly, very succinctly in a way that they can understand that's quantifiable and actionable. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to add to that. I mean, you two are both definitely the experts, but I feel like for me, a couple of different takeaways is, you know, think about being responsible and less impactful versus eco-friendly and um, that kind of stuff. Good point. Um, on top of that, I think, again, that point of 
I think that I'm going to come back to it, but the layers of, you know, give that in basic information to inform and enlighten consumers, but then for those who want to be educated, give them those added layers. And then also, again, it's that it's that journey, isn't it? It's the short versus the long term and taking into consideration all of those different factors. So I'm going to end there. Thank you to everybody for listening. The conversation does not end here. Please head over to Mintel's LinkedIn or Instagram and do let us know what you thought of today's episode. If you want to know more about Mintel, who we are, what we do, please head over to mintel.com and check out our blog for even more insights from our analysts. And with that, please also do watch out for Mintel's second edition of our sustainability barometer, which is due to be released in the second week of August. So watch out for that coming. And finally, please make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time for another episode of Mintel's Little Conversation. 